Hello, I'm John Osteen, Pastor Lakewood Church. This is my wife, Dodie. We've got a very special program for you today. You're going to find out a lot of, more about our family and about our church. You're going to see where we came from, a dream that has come true. You know, you have to fight life through to make your dreams come true. You have dreams in your heart? Are you having a tough time in life? You think you're going to quit? Stay tuned, because Jesus is going to make you a winner. In 1939, God called a young man from the Texas prairie to begin a ministry that would reach to the ends of the earth. And today, more than 50 years later, Pastor John Osteen has kept that vision of reaching the unreached and telling the untold. Building a church where more than 10,000 people are being touched every week with the gospel. Taking the good news of Jesus Christ throughout North America via television and now making an impact in the nations of the earth, where pastors are trained and supported for a new generation of men like John Osteen, hearing the voice of God and answering that call. From the streets of Fort Worth to a vacant feed store, and now, exploding decades later into a ministry that reaches literally around the globe, a ministry that spans 50 years of miracles. And now, Pastor John Osteen. Welcome to our program today. I'm Dodie Osteen. John will be joining us in a little while, but I have two of my daughters here, and I'm so glad to have them. This is Lisa, and this is our youngest daughter, April Simons, and I, I just appreciate the fact that they took time off to come with me today and be here in our program. You know, we're going to be talking to you about some dreams and how your dreams can come true. You know all of us have dreams. I remember from the time I was a little girl, I used to dream I was going to do this and that, and some of them I'm glad they haven't come to pass. But Jesus will always help you when you have a dream that you want fulfilled in your life. You know, you can turn to other things in the world, and they won't help your dreams to come true, but the Lord Jesus will. He is a God of the impossible. God is a God that will invade storms. Maybe some of you have had a dream in your heart since you were a little child, and it never has come to pass, and you think that it never will. You think you've made a mess of your life. You've ruined your life. You've hurt others, but you know God will pick up those pieces. God wastes nothing, and He will take those things that have been so bad in your life and cause them to turn around for your good. You know, He will cause a storm to cease, he, just like he did when the disciples were in the boat and he caused that storm to cease. He, Jesus will invade a storm. Maybe you're going through a storm now in your life and it looks like you'll never have anything financially, materially, physically, whatever. Maybe your health is poor now and you feel like you'll never have anything. Your dream will never come to pass. God will invade that storm if you call upon him. He will cause your dream to come true. That's right, Mom. And you know, many people have written us and they've asked us, how did Lakewood Church begin? How did all this come about? And it really came about when God put a dream in my dad's heart many years ago. You know, today we see Lakewood, Lakewood Church is a great outreach center. It's seating 8,200 people and every week thousands of people stream into this church to hear the Word of God. And last year we gave over $4 million to World Missions. God is really using Lakewood today. But you know what? It hasn't always been this way. It really began many years ago with a miracle. That's right. And you know, speaking of dreams, if anybody didn't think their dream would come true, it would, be, it would be my dad. You know, he used to be a popcorn salesman and he was a dropout of high school. As a matter of fact, let's take you on back. The year is 1921. In 1921, Rudolph Valentino starred in the motion picture, The Sheik. Blue Moon was the most popular song. Jack Dempsey successfully defended his world heavyweight boxing title. And the first radio coverage of the World Series was carried by WJZ Radio in Newark, New Jersey.
but in the middle of what seemed like a national feeling of celebration, deep, dark clouds were looming on the horizon. The scars of World War I were still healing as the unknown soldier was quietly buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Bootleggers were doing bigger and bigger business, selling poor quality liquor that sometimes caused blindness and death. And in the middle of 1921, America found itself in a depression that would prove to foreshadow the greater depression of the 30s. Some say that when God wants to touch the world, a baby is born. And on a hot, dusty August day in northeastern Texas near the Oklahoma border, a new baby's cry was heard for the first time. John Osteen entered the world without much fanfare, and the world he entered was a world that needed help. My earliest recollection is being on a farm where we lived in Paris, Texas, two miles out on the highway north of Paris. And my father and mother uh, were a farming family. We, uh, we raised cotton. And I remember those days that uh, we helped uh, uh, on the farm. And the first time I picked cotton, they said I'd earn money. And so uh, I didn't know, I didn't know how it would come, you know, if you pick cotton, you'd earn money. So they got me a little flour sack, put it around me as a little child, and I'd pick cotton a while, and I'd look in my pocket, pick a while, and I'd look in my pocket. They said I'd get money. I never did get any. I didn't realize Daddy would have to pay me. His dad was an unusual man. He had a wonderful personality, and he knew just what to say and what not to say at the right time. And his mother and father were hard-working people. We moved to town and uh, still farmed, and then the Great Depression came, and, and uh, that had a tremendous effect upon me. You know, people talk about being against the prosperity message. You just have to live in poverty to really know uh, what you're saying when you make a statement against prosperity. When you stood in bread lines, when you stood in, in milk lines to get Blue John milk, when you've uh, gotten up in the morning with, with nothing to eat, and you have to look at your mother when she has to tell you there's nothing to eat. You never think poverty is a blessing anymore. I'll tell you there's something about poverty that's a curse. When you go to high school with holes in your shoes and with uh, a biscuit in your pocket to eat, when you, when you face a depression like that, you never, never are on the side of poverty. The 30s were a whirlwind of loss. The Great Depression stole the inheritance from a once proud nation. The pains of war were beginning to erupt around the globe, and selling apples on street corners became the indelible image of a country in torment. But God still had not washed his hands of a young man in Fort Worth, Texas. I wanted some of my friends to know about Jesus. And I started to work on, on John. And he seemed to be a little ashamed to know me for a while. Because in school, in the classrooms, if I had a chance to give a report, I always put in a good word for Jesus. And things changed, though, after a while. Well, you know, I dropped out of high school, and uh, I was just sort of drifting around. I did have a job in the ISIS Theater in North Fort Worth, Texas. It's still there. And uh, my heart was empty, and I began to go to these uh, places we called dance halls then. And, and it was about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. I was coming home, and, and somehow the Lord just began to deal with my heart. And, and uh, uh, suddenly I began to think about time and eternity and heaven and hell and what am I going to do with my life. And, and I think he had come in... Uh, the next day, which was Saturday, from uh, the casino. And he came by my house, as well as I remember, it's probably a Saturday around uh, noon. And he was a bit disturbed. He said, Sam, what, what's the matter with me? I have some questions I want to ask. I tried to find a Bible in the house, and finally I found an old family Bible. It was around 2, 2 30 in the morning, but then, and uh, I, I opened it, I couldn't read it. I, I mean, I couldn't understand it if, when I did read it. 
But just as I went to the front door, the screen door, we didn't have air conditioning those days, just as my finger touched the screen door to open it, something said to me, I understand now it was the Lord, turn again and open the family Bible. Well, I went back I, with one flip. I opened it somewhere in the middle, and there was a picture of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And underneath it said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. And I couldn't understand the theology of it, but I could understand opening and closing a door because I was about to open one when he spoke to me. John, I said, You, you need Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you to tell you it's your time to receive him as your savior. And to make a long story short, we got out on our knees. I led him through the sinner's prayer. And if I remember correctly, the next day was Sunday. And we went to church and listened to our pastor. And when the invitation was given, uh, I said, let's go. He was ready to go. And we walked down the aisle together. and. He's been going ever since then. Within 30 days, John Osteen was preaching the gospel. Anywhere I could find to preach. I was preaching in the jails, in what we called the poor farms then, and, uh, and, the, and the rescue missions, on the street. Anywhere I could preach, I preached. Sometimes when I'd come in from work, why, uh, he wouldn't be there. And so I'd ask some of the other people there in the dorm, well, well where's John? Well, uh, John went out to preach. And, uh, uh, well, where, where, where did he go? Well, I don't know. I think he hitchhiked over to this uh, next town, over to Gentry or uh, one of the other towns close by, and is, is preaching at a little church. But after a number of years preaching in a major denomination, John Osteen was unsatisfied. I was pastor uh, of the uh, Central Baptist Church in Baytown, Texas, and my heart was so hungry for God. I remember reading the book of Acts, and the Gospels in my, in my office there, in that Baptist church, and I would have cut off my right arm to have what the Bible says they had. But every voice of every professor rose up to say, it's not for today. There used to be miracles, no more today. All this has passed away. No more baptism in the Holy Ghost. No more signs and wonders. Frustrated and searching, he left the pastorate behind and joined the world of business and 1959 saw the former pastor selling insurance. But anyway, I resigned because I was so discouraged and I went in the insurance business and I was successful. But I was miserable, developed ulcers in my stomach because I was out of the will of God. And uh, I remember I was in a, in a businessman's office and uh, he cursed so much and used such profanity, it shocked me. And I said, well, I better talk to him about Jesus. And I said, have you ever thought about becoming a Christian? And he exploded. I mean, he really did get mad then. He said, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. And he grabbed a great big book and he said, do you see this? This is the course for the deeper life, deeper spiritual life in our church denomination. And I am the teacher of that. When I left there, a bomb exploded in my heart. I said, oh God, is this the kind of Christian we've developed by denying the power of God? Within one year after quitting the ministry, Osteen's heart began burning again. The callings of God are without repentance, and God was still calling that pastor. After much soul searching, the insurance salesman went back to selling the only complete and foolproof insurance policy ever created, the saving and redemptive power of Jesus Christ. Osteen went back to preaching, but this time with a new passion new questions. Where are the miracles? Where is that divine plus? Where is that group of people who can say we're in touch with God? And most of all, a new vision. And that was the driving force that uh, led me to accept uh, the pastorship of the Hibbard Memorial Baptist Church and start my search for the baptism. I said, God, if you are to be found in power in this generation, I'm going to climb the hill of God. I'm going to wrap my fingers in your garments. I'll not be shaken off. I will find your power for this generation. And I made my uh, journey to begin, and thank God it ended in the power of the Holy Ghost. He was looking for that miracle-working God of the Bible, the Holy Spirit alive and active in the believer's life. He had a new commitment, but he needed a catalyst, a burning bush, an event that would forever change John Osteen's direction and ministry. In July of 1958, 
John and Dodi Osteen had a beautiful baby daughter, Lisa. But from the beginning, there was trouble. The doctors diagnosed cerebral palsy. She would never be normal. She said, Ms. Osteen, you just have to accept the fact that you have a, an abnormal child with brain damage. And um, evidently, the umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck and cut this oxygen supply off. My, my youngest son was in the nursery at the same time that Lisa was. And so I'd go in there, and I'd see that little baby, and all the other little babies would be uh, kicking their feet and moving their hands and, and everything, and little Lisa would just be lying there in the crib with no, no movement, no, no muscles, nothing. Whatever you did with her, she just stayed that way. When she cried, she sounded like a little hurt animal. You could hardly hear. She's a pitiful little, well, kind of like a pitiful little blob. Turning from the path he had preached for 19 years, John and Doty anointed that precious daughter with oil and prayed the prayer of faith. It was a process. During the agonizing months of prayer, John and Doty began a new journey toward the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then, things began to happen. And he said, now we're going to pray for her, and then we're going to thank Jesus that she's healed. So as our, our little son was three years old when she was born, and, uh, and we'd stand around the bed when she didn't look like she was any different. And we'd say, thank you, Jesus, for healing her. It was just like watching a miracle unfold before our eyes. But I remember saying, well, John, no matter what, I'll take care of that little thing all of her life, whether or not she's in a wheelchair. Within seven months, Lisa reached a milestone. The simple act of sitting up, a miracle was taking place in front of their eyes. That was over 30 years ago, and you can see by looking at Lisa that she's perfectly normal now. She's always excelled in school. She graduated from Oral Roberts University. She goes all over the world teaching the good news about Jesus. She's got a wonderful ministry of teaching and preaching the Word of God, and we're so blessed. And, and Lisa, God really did a wonderful thing in your life. He did, and I'm so thankful that He touched me and completely healed me, and I'm thankful that, uh, that you and Daddy got a hold of God and found out that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank God He still heals, and He healed me. And I just want to encourage you today because I know that many of you are facing battles in your life. You have dreams in your heart. I don't know what they are, but maybe it has to do with your marriage or with your finances, or maybe you need physical healing in your body. Whatever it is, Jesus is concerned, and He is the same today for you also, and He will touch you, and He will cause your dreams to come to pass. And you know, one of the things that ushered my dad into the knowledge of the healing power of Jesus Christ was receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But you know, not everyone was real happy with that decision. As a matter of fact, let's go and hear what the chairman of the Board of Deacons had to say about it. The first morning he mentioned it, I knew that that's what I'd wanted all my life. I was all for it, first morning. He asked us, he, he, he preached, and he told what had happened to him as near as he understood it and uh, just preached about this power from God. And he says, now, you can all have this same thing. Those of you that want it, come down, kneel down up here at the front. And I went down and knelt down, and some power seemed to be just forcing my hands to go up, and I thought, I can't do that, and I'd bring my hands down. I was sitting, plotting on Sunday night with one of the other deacons to whether we were going to have the sheriff come put his possessions out on the street, whether we were going, to, how we were going to get rid of him. Monday night, I got to, I loved him as a man. I wasn't mad at him as a man. I was mad at what his theology was. And it had changed, you see. It wasn't Southern Baptist. It was scriptural, but it wasn't Southern Baptist. People couldn't understand this about the miracles. They believed the Bible, they believed everything that God said, but they did not believe about the healing. And uh, our being filled with the Holy Ghost, they felt that that was for another time, that it was no longer needed, that it was not for this day. They were going to have the trial and the vote on me on Wednesday night, and on Tuesday night, uh, this, this wife and the chairman of the deacons uh, took him 
and another deacon and his wife to Evangelistic Temple here in Houston, Texas, and they all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. On Tuesday night, before the Wednesday night a trial, and instead of being against it, he was for it, and he had told everybody, vote like I do, and when he voted for us to stay, they all voted, and we got 82%. <laughs> You know, those times were really hard for me because I was a young pastor's wife and uh, I had a lot of friends in the church. They loved me so much and then suddenly our friendship ceased and I haven't seen uh, most of them in over 30 years now. But we knew that we had something to do for God. So we went right ahead and did what Jesus told us to do because we wanted to be in His perfect will. You know, even though they voted to keep my dad as their pastor, the opposition became so great that he decided to launch out and start his own ministry. It was at that time that he formed Lakewood Baptist Church. The year was 1958, and John Osteen was in a mood to launch out. In spite of the fact that his church had voted to keep him, Osteen decided to start a new church, and before long moved to an abandoned feed store. As you can see, it was not the most luxurious building in the world. It was so pitiful and so ugly, <laughs> and it had spider webs everywhere. It was a, a, actually a feed store where they sold feed for, for our animals. And uh, it's the only place that we really had rent-free because there was a family in the church that let us use it. It was, it was in pretty bad shape, uh, if, if you can understand. Uh, the cracks in the floor was about, they was made for feed, you know, and they made cracks so the dust and stuff would sift through. I had seen the building from the outside, and he came home and he said, uh, Mrs. Carpenter has offered to let us use the building, the old feed store. And I said, no way, no way. I will not go down there. I will not. I refuse. I will not. The next Sunday, I was down there with the rest of them. I fell through the roof. We were roof, getting up there, taking the old tent off, and I fell, fell through the sheetrock. It was what little bit of sheetrock was in the ceiling, and it fell through on down to the bottom. It had holes in the floor. It had tin on the side, tin on the top, but we were happy, happy, happy. It was started as Lakewood Baptist Church. But when a storm damaged the sign and the word Baptist was blown away, it was just never replaced. Lakewood Church has never been the same. Lakewood has always been a source of strength to me because even in, in hard times, we can come here and get lifted up every time, every service. Well, I think Lakewood is a place where people of all different uh, personalities and nationalities can come under one roof and receive the Word of God and the love of God. The very atmosphere of being here, the, the Spirit of God that I sensed when I entered the place, I could just sense the Spirit of God, the very presence of God, and it was just so wonderful to be able to worship God out here. And it's just grassroots, you know, it's just the teaching of the Bible that really has helped me and my family. And we know that Brother Osteen is going to deliver that Word of God with a sincerity and a faithfulness, and he's not going to be afraid to to speak up and say what God's Word says. Lakewood is a beautiful place to worship God. It's a free freedom of uh, the Spirit of God, and it's all people to come in together to worship and magnify the Lord. I come to Lakewood because there's it's home. There's warmth. It's, it's wonderful. I feel at home. The fact that Pastor Osteen can put a message out, and it's simple, and you don't have to dig through and find out what it means. The presence of God is here to touch people, to heal people, to deliver people, and he touches my life and excites me. Well, that's what Lakewood is all about. I got so excited watching uh, this footage, hearing these people. I'm so glad that we help suffering, sighing, crying, dying humanity. People come here by the thousands. We are seeing our dreams come true. When you think about that little feed store there and then look at this massive Lakewood Church reaching out to the world. Only Jesus could do that. Certainly it was not me and Dodie. It was not our family, but it was the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you, when you meet per troubled humanity, you meet people everywhere in need. Uh, we say with Jesus of our own self, we can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. Can I have an amen, amen. Dodie? <laughs> well, we just get excited about it. That's our dream. Our dream. And uh, we're concerned about your dream. 
We know all of you have dreams. Some of them have been smashed. Some of them have been, have been ruined. And you think you could never dream again. But oh, great it is to dream the dream when you stand in youth by the starry stream. But a greater thing is to fight life through and say at the end, the dream is true. You know, we have preachers come here, here all the time and often they'll say, as they did even in the, in the last Sunday morning service, they said, we want this to happen like Lakewood in our town. And I told Dodie going home, they may want it to happen, but I wonder if they're willing to fight through 20 years and make it happen. See, dreams just don't happen. You have to fight life through and say at the end, the dream is true. Well, your dreams can come true. You see, you, you think, well, I called on God and, and God didn't answer and, and look uh, what's happening to me. Well, you've got to fight life through. You've got to fight off doubt and unbelief. You've got to fight off the devil and demon forces. You have to say no. I'm more determined than you are, devil. I'm going to see my dreams come true. You do all you can do to make them come true. Then you trust God for what you can't do. Well, we're going to pray for you. Let's join hands together. Father, I just pray that you will touch every person here. Oh, God, bless every minister. Bless every minister's wife, every minister's husband, all the family of God that's listening here today and those who want to belong to the family of God. Touch them, oh God. Encourage their hearts. Lord, let them not quit, but to go on and to get victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray it, and I believe, and everybody said amen. 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 Well, if you're ever in, Lakewood, uh, in the Houston area, come by Lakewood Church. You don't have to join to be out there. We have a lot of people who have joined. And I'll tell you, God is so good. We have thousands of people who call Lakewood Church their home. You come out and let us bless you. We're looking for you. Till this time next week, God bless you.